Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. Good morning. This is going to be my first time on video, so I wondered if I can rely on my notes. You got it. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior in my late 20s. For my early spiritual development was largely influenced by a movement called Lay Witness. And what this was was a lay-led weekend event, renewal event, that was held in local churches. Uh, someone would be assigned to the preaching spot. Uh, so one weekend, when my wife and I were attending one of these events, we were uh, selected as the uh, people to fill the preaching spot. Uh, this was uh, quite a surprise to us. As a consequence, we hadn't prepared anything for the 20 minutes that we were slated to uh, preach in. So my wife and I uh, uh, looked out from the pulpit and saw the thousand plus people out in the congregation. And that's when I had to totally rely on the Lord. And I said, God, uh, this morning is in your hands. And I prayed to him to let me find the words to use that morning to uh, increase someone's faith. Uh, I don't know what I said that morning, but after the service, a number of people came up to us and said how much they appreciated what we had shared. Lord, uh, only you could have pulled off this morning, and to you all the praise. From the start, when I stood before that large congregation and needed to share my testimony, I knew that I couldn't do it on myself. I had to rely on Christ to do it. You know, if you've ever worshipped in our sanctuary, you know there's a, there's a large pulpit right there in the center of the platform. And it's where the pastor stands to preach. It's where the minister of music, he, um, he leads congregational worship. And it's, it's a place of great importance. It's central in the, in the worship in the sanctuary. Well, here we have a music stand. But if you were in the sanctuary, on that pulpit, whenever the pastor walks up, there's a small plaque. And engraved on that little plaque are just these simple words. Sir, we'd like to see Jesus. John chapter 12. Sir, we'd like to see Jesus. You know, may that be the prayer of our heart today as we consider Christ alone. That as we enter into this place of worship at this moment, as we open up the Word of God, that we might see Jesus. You know, I know whenever we enter into a, a center of worship, into a sanctuary or the great hall, that we come with different needs, different perspectives. I would imagine there is someone in this room or in the chapel this morning or in one of the later hour services that yesterday had no thought that they were going to end up at Park City's Baptist Church. But something happened. Circumstances changed. They're, they're here. You may be here. There are others that are here, and you are so captured by the grace of God, you would be nowhere else. It is just your heart's desire that whenever the family gathers, you're there. And we're at Park Cities. We're not going to raise hands a lot. But maybe in your hearts, you're raising your hand, and you're saying, yes, yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done for me. There are others that are in this room, and you're here because this, this is what you do. You love Jesus. You, you love God's church. You love God's people. And and it's your habit, it's your pattern. Others are here because it's good for the kids. Your circle of friends is here. This is where you find community. I, I've talked to people in the past who've been really honest with me and said, listen, I, I make contacts there. It's, it's good for business. There's a variety of reasons that we gather within this worship. But at this moment, at this time, I'm going to ask you to do something. Would you ask God to help you see Jesus? 
Would you ask God to help you see Jesus? You know, on that last day, as Jesus hung on that cross, His disciples were there. But all except John were removed. They were at a great distance. And so today, what I'm asking you to do is to come in. To come in close. And ask the Lord Himself to help you see Jesus and Jesus alone today. Let's pray for a moment. And so, Father, as we gather, I pray that you'd use this time and you'd use it to your great glory. And you'd use it to help us understand your love and the freedom that we have in Jesus. And may the ripples of this day float across our lives and all across eternity. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, when I was 18, I met Jesus Christ. I've, I've never shared my testimony, my story from the stage or the platforms at Park Cities, but I met Christ at 18. Now, I had been churched. I had come from a different denominational tradition, but we were a churched family, and I went to Sunday school as a child, and to the best of my memories, I pretty much liked it. I, I enjoyed it. We didn't go a lot, but we went. Now, Vacation Bible School was a different story. If there was a Vacation Bible School within 10 miles, we were going to be there during the summer because it was great child care. <laughs> but I even liked Vacation Bible School, and we'd go to worship. As I grew older, that worship experience grew a little less and less frequent. And by the time I was in high school, we very rarely ever went. We would be what I would call a cultural Christian. We had a, a tradition we, we could answer the question, if someone said, where do you go to church? We could say, and we could name the church. But really, that was the extent of my, my experience as a child. But I'll tell you this, whenever I was there, I can remember, again, I was a different denominational tradition, I was confirmed. And I can remember in confirmation, not understanding what I was feeling, but I felt something. God was doing something within me. There was a restlessness there. Well, I went on through high school, and, and for those of you that know me, you know I'm not the most exciting guy around. I'm going to tell you something. When I was 18, I was duller than I am now. It's not that I had this incredible, dramatic transformation. I didn't. But something happened in my life, and it happened as a result of just a restlessness. I graduated high school. I kind of breezed through. I went into college, and I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. None. And I began to ask questions, and I began to really seek. And in my seeking, I found, and I found Jesus. I found Christ. So I was preparing for this message. I found a quote that I had filed away a long time ago. It's from C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis says this, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is, I was made for another world. Does that describe you today? Is there a restlessness within your spirit? Are the satisfactions of life not what you expected? You were made for something bigger. You were made for something better. Augustine says this, You made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find you. And that was me. I was restless. But then I found Christ. You know, in recent weeks, our pastor has been leading us through the five solas of the Reformation. We've been looking back at the 500th anniversary coming up on October 31st of the Reformation and what the Reformers had to say to the church in that day and what it says to the church in this day. We began looking at Scripture as the foundation of our theology and we talked about how the Reformers believed and they taught that it was the sovereign grace of God alone, grace alone through faith alone, grounded in and through Christ alone. That's our story. That's our testimony. When people ask us our story, that's our story. Christ alone. And so we come to the sola of solus Christus. Christ alone. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians. And we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. And we read here from the hand of Paul an exposition of what it means to really trust in the supremacy of Christ. Paul has written to this to the church at Colossae. Chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And for by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, 
the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now this letter was written approximately 60 A.D. Epaphras had come to Paul. Paul has been imprisoned in Rome. He's able to receive guests, and he's able to teach and even to preach to those that gather. And he's brought a message of what's happening in this church in Colossae. Colossae would have been in modern-day Turkey. And he tells that there is a, a teaching that is beginning to percolate into the church from the outside. And this teaching diminished Jesus. It depreciated the work of Christ. It depreciated the cross. And so Paul takes his pen and he writes this letter. And this is a wonderful letter. We went through this a couple of years ago. A wonderful letter where Paul helps us understand the supremacy of Christ. And look with me in verse 15. In verse 15, he says he is the image of the invisible God. Now, if you're like me and you take notes, here's your first point. Christ is the revealer. Christ is the revealer. It says he's the image of the invisible God. Now, in ancient times, what a ruler would do to indicate their authority, they would have a, a seal, and it would have their representation on it. They might have a little stamp that would have a drawing, a representation of the authority. And whenever something was sent out, it would have that seal upon it and indicated the authority of the one who was sending it. If you've gone to the United Kingdom, you've seen their coinage, and you see the same thing on their coins. You'll see the image of Queen Elizabeth. It indicates the authority of the crown. And what Paul is saying here is that Christ is the image of the invisible God. He's the divine representation of God Himself. So really simply to say this, if you want to know what God is like, you look to Jesus. If you want to know God, you look to Jesus. The author of Hebrews in chapter 1-3 says this, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation, the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. He's the exact representation. If you want to know God, you know Jesus. If you want to know the love of God, you look to Jesus. We have on this platform here the cross. The cross of Christ. It's central in everything we do. And my friends, in this church, Christ has to be the head. We'll talk about that in a moment. If not, we are to be pitied. We have no reason to gather. It is the cross of Christ. We have wonderful facilities. We have great music. We have programs for every age and every need. But without Christ, we're just a tinkling symbol. And it's Christ that reveals God to us. Secondly, Christ is the Creator. Christ is the Creator. Look in verses 16 and 17. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. And all things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Now give me a little bit of license here. What I imagine happened is, Epaphras takes this letter back to the church. The church gathers. Maybe they gather in the early evening. And their letter's read to them. They've heard the words of Paul. They've heard about Christ as the representation of Jesus. And they walk out into the evening skies and skies that are unclouded by the lights of modern society. And they see the beauty of God's creation all around them. They can see the stars of the Milky Way as they have been tossed across the sky by the Lord Himself, spoken into existence by His power. And they remember the words of Paul. Paul says, For by Him, who? By Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And listen to this. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. In Him all things hold together. 
This past Tuesday, I was coming into the office early, and as I was driving down the highway, I noticed the, the sun as it was beginning to rise. The skies turned the most beautiful shades of pink. You may have seen it. They even commented on the radio. It was just gorgeous, and I just, without even thinking, said, Lord, thank you. The creation always points us back to the Creator, and it points us to the love of God. And my friends, we need to understand it's Christ that is the Creator. It is through Him. And it points us to the love that is in God. Now take just a moment and let your mind kind of settle on that. Astronomers would tell you that the universe cannot be measured. I did a little bit of research this week. I couldn't even write the number of zeros, and they're not even finished counting. The number of stars are in the billions. And God created. And He created through His Son, Jesus Christ. And Christ holds it all together. Think of that. This universe that we cannot fathom is controlled. It is, it is held together by Christ Himself. I was reading the other day and I saw this article and it said that the moon is the exact right size for life on earth. You think, well, what does the moon have to do with life on earth? It said if the moon was any larger, that it would shift through its gravitational pull, the axis of the earth. And because of that, half the earth would be subjected to unbearable heat, while the other half was subjected to unbearable cold, sub-zero temperatures. And it said life would not be able to exist. This life that God breathed Himself into us, this life that God created, I know we have doctors in here. You could not be in the medical arts and sciences without marveling at the creation that God made within the human body. You can't study any of the sciences without understanding that there is a pattern, there is a creation, and it was created by Christ, and He holds it all together. Not just all things. He holds our lives together if we'll allow Him. If we'll allow Him. You know, there's a passage in Romans 8 that says all things work together for good. And everybody says, wow, that's great. It's misquoted. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. For those that are following Jesus every day, all things will work to good. You know, Justin said it earlier, life is messy. I have an email from someone today talking about a diagnosis. I've talked to people in recent weeks whose lives are falling apart. We're not immune from sin. We're not immune from what's happening. It seems like our culture is pulling apart at the seams. We're not immune to that. But what we understand by the Word of God is that ultimately it's Christ that holds it all together. He holds it all together. Years ago, I had a, an older pastor. He had founded the uh, Georgia Baptist Foundation. He was brilliant. And he kind of took me under his wings, Dr. Harry Smith. And Dr. Smith, I was taking him home one day. He said, you know, I want to preach just one more sermon. I said, well, what is it, Dr. Smith? He said, the gentleman Jesus. He said, you know, Jesus never forces his way in. He always knocks. He always, he's always invited in. I want you to stop for just a moment. Think about that truth. He holds it all together. What about your life? Think for a moment about all that is just surrounding your life in these days. Are you allowing Him to hold you together? Your kids, your marriage, your career, our community? He wants to do so. But He's a gentleman. Christ is our Creator. Number three, Christ is our Redeemer. Look with me in verses 18 and 20. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. You know, I want to show you a Bible. It's a Bible I bought when I was first had come to know Jesus. In fact, I noticed this morning as I was looking in it, the date that I bought it's in here. And it's so long ago, I'm not going to tell you when it was. You know, as I looked at it, I thought, I wish I hadn't thought it was a sin to write in the Bible because I'd love to have known the notes I was taking. I can remember that I would lay in bed at night and I would devour this. I should have been studying college algebra. I got it there by the skin of my teeth. But I was reading Scripture. 
I was trying to understand this one who had created me and who had redeemed me and what he had to say to me. Now, this Bible was a paraphrase, this living Bible, and it's called The Way. The Way. Okay, I see a few hands being raised of people about my age. And in The Way, I came to John 14, 6. In John 14, 6, in the Living Bible translation, Jesus says this, I am the way, yes, and the truth and the life, and no one can get to the Father except by means of me. What's the story there? In this story, Jesus makes a very exclusive claim. He is the way, and He is the way to God Himself. Now, the background of this is, it's the last night. They're in the upper room. They've gathered for the Passover. Jesus has washed their feet. They've celebrated Passover. New meaning has been ascribed to it for believers. Judas is left, and Jesus is left with the rest. And He sees people who don't have a clue what's going on. There's concern. There's probably some fear. The week hasn't gone the way they thought. Just on Sunday, they were greeted with the parade, and now here is on Thursday, and they're hiding out, afraid for their lives. What's happened? And he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go there to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, I went through that quick. I don't think he did. And I think the words kind of settled. And then one of the disciples, Thomas, you might call him Doubting Thomas. I call him Pragmatic Thomas. He just asked what everybody else was thinking. You know, God's not concerned. He's not bothered by my questions, by your questions. And he said, excuse me, we don't know where you're going. And if we don't know where you're going, we don't know how to get there. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You've heard Jeff say many a times, that is an exclusive claim. But it is the most inclusive exclusive exclusivity known to man. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way. But the way is as broad as the very heart of God. And He provided the way for us in the cross. He did what we could not do for ourselves. The Bible says He loves the world. And in verse 18, He says He is preeminent. The NIV says He has the supremacy of all things. Look with me in verse 18 again. In verse 18, He says He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. What does that mean? It means that we as a church are set apart And from a social organization, we are the church of the living God. And Christ is our head. You know, I brought with me, I don't have time to pull it out, but I brought our church constitution. Now, there's some scintillating reading there. But in the constitution, our church constitution declares that Christ is the head of this church. This is Christ's church. This is Christ's church. And that's what Paul is saying right here, that Christ is the head of His church. And it's the church that God uses to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the church. And he also goes on to say in verse 18 that he's the firstborn from among the dead. Now, years ago, I can remember a a kid asked me, but he had raised Lazarus. He raised others. If you remember his ministry, there, there were people who were raised from the dead, probably others that we're not told about. What about that? They were all raised to die again, but not Christ. Not Christ. When Christ was taken off that cross and He was taken to the tomb, on Easter Sunday morning when they came, the tomb was empty. And it's still empty. One of my favorite passages in Scripture is when they came that morning and the angels greeted them and said, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He's not here. He is what? He is risen. He is alive, and out of that tomb flows hope and life and light. Why? So that He might have the supremacy. He is preeminent. It is Christ alone. Solas Christus, Christ alone. That is the proclamation that we have, and He is the head of His church. Now, this was the teaching that Martin Luther and the Reformers were trying to get to. In fact, what they were doing is they were going back to what Paul was addressing. It's the same heresy. 
And that is Jesus plus. What was happening in Colossae and what continued to develop in the early church was this idea that it's not Christ alone. That it is our merit. It is what we bring to the table. And in the church of the medieval times, that's exactly what was happening. That was what was happening. And they addressed it. Martin Luther was an interesting man. As a young man, as I was restless, he was restless. And he strove to be perfect. He strove for perfection. It's said that his friends feared for his life. He would fast so much, they thought that he was going to die. He would mortify his body. He would, he would beat himself. He would sleep without a blanket in the evening to pray, uh, to pray for his perfection. He would go begging for his food to experience humiliation. And Luther himself wrote, I thought I would die. If I'd kept it on any longer, I would have. I'd have died. I would have killed myself with all of the vigils, all the prayers, all the readings, and all the work. And what he discovered is what we should discover, and that is Jesus plus never works. It's Christ. It's Christ on the cross. He is our hope. He's hope in life, and He's hope in our death. So as I was going through this, I thought, okay, here's a logical question. Then if He has done it all, and my work matters not, why serve? Why give? It's done. It's a great question. We don't give to earn the favor. As they would have said in Luther's time, to earn merits, to build merits. We serve, we give because of love. It overflows out of us. The best example I can give you is, back years ago in a previous church, I was a minister to preschoolers. I loved it. I mean, why are you laughing? I, was, I wasn't bad. I was good. We had a need for about 400 plus preschoolers every Sunday morning. Or excuse me, preschool teachers every Sunday morning. Now think about that. I don't know how many are in here, but there's not many more than 400, 500 in here today. That's a lot of people. And I didn't have them when I first got there. And I developed a gift, and the gift was called guilt. I pulled from the oldest playbook, play in the playbook, and that was guilt. And I was good at it. And I started filling up all of those slots. And what I discovered by the Spirit of God was that I was in sin. I was manipulating people. I was doing exactly what the reformers were railing against. I was manipulating people to my ends. It didn't matter if my ends were the needs of the kids. It was still wrong, and I stopped. I stopped just like that. And I began to put prayer groups around me, and we began to pray and ask God, and we began to talk about the joy of God's children and what you received from being with the children. And what we saw was that God began to bring the workers. I'd always said, if He's given us the kids, He's providing the resource. Now, one of the glories of Park City's Baptist Church is all of our young families. Kids matter here. Families matter here. And it matters that mamas and daddies believe that they can bring their children to us and they're going to be loved and cared for and ministered to. And I'm not guilting anybody, but we have needs. We have needs, and I want you to know one of the great joys you'll have is providing for those parents, providing for those children, to be able to rock that baby and be one of the first to say, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. We give, we serve, we minister out of full hearts. Why? Because of what God has done in our lives. You know, in a few weeks, we're going to be opening up an access project over in the sanctuary for those with special physical needs. It's only 60 years late. We should have done it six decades ago. But we're doing it. You know how we're funding it? Through you. Your generosity. And some people have given sacrificially to make this happen, but there's not a one of them, I believe, that gave because they felt that they had to. We give because we feel compelled to because of all that God has done for us. You know, the happiest people I know in this church are the people who give unreservedly of themselves. The people who are serving in preschool or they're serving in ministries on this campus. Maybe they're greeting. Maybe they're at Cornerstone or they're in the Vickery area. I don't know how many of you know Terry Hurd, but Terry Hurd is in Vickery every day of the week. And Terry just has a love of Jesus all over her. 
Why? Because she's giving herself out of a response of what God has given us. He's given us our lives, our eternity. And He's done it through Jesus. He is the Redeemer. He's the Redeemer of our eternity. And He's the Redeemer of your life. And we can't help but respond out of the joy of our salvation. He is the central theme of our ministry and our lives. It is Christ and it's Christ alone. Now keep looking back at the Scriptures. Look at verses 19 and 20. He says, For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. What He says here is, He redeems our lives and our eternities through the cross of Jesus Christ. He did what we could not do for ourselves. Paul writes in Romans 5, 8, But God showed His love for us while we were yet sinners. And Christ died for us. It's the cross. And I want you to notice, all through here, where is the initiative coming from? It's not from us. It's from Him. For God so loved. I cannot earn it. I cannot achieve it. It's what He gives to me, and He gives to me freely. But I have to ask. He's the Redeemer of my eternity, but my friends, I want you to understand, He wants to be the Redeemer of this day and every day. Christ is Redeemer. He's our Redeemer. As we close, number four, Jesus is the Recreator. He's the Recreator. Look in verse 21. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. You know, when I was 18, I told you I wasn't out just raising all sorts of stuff. I was churched. I was moral. And I was alienated. I was lost. I was lost from God, and I knew it. And that was the central part of my restlessness. I was lost. Verse 22 continues, And He is now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in Him. My friends, it is not our merit. It is what Christ did for us. Paul goes on to write later in Colossians that he set it all aside. He nailed our sin to the cross. While we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. He is the Redeemer of our lives and our eternity. The way the NIV talks about this, it says, but now, but now He has reconciled Himself to you. He is the initiator. And because of this, I am a new creation. I'm a new creation. You know, this past Wednesday night, I was in Lower Level Collins for a committee meeting. If you can believe this, it was a three and a half hour committee meeting. We took a little bit of a break, and I noticed on the back wall from this past Sunday, the teacher had written a question Who's Jesus? Who's Jesus? It was interesting to see all the things they had written on the board. And as I, I read them, I thought about a passage, and I went home and I looked it up. It's from the book of Mark. And in the book of Mark, chapter 8, Jesus is with his disciples, and he says, Who do people say I am? Who do people say I am? And they replied, Some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say you're one of the prophets. People say, I am. But then he looked at him and he said this, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say I am? And that's the question for our life and for our eternity. Who do we say, who do I say that Jesus is? It's a question that he asked the disciples. It's a question that he asked us. He wants to be the redeemer of your eternity, but He wants to be the redeemer of your days. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.